Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Policy Exchange. My name's Larry Elliott. I, I'm the economics editor there. Um, we're going to have uh, an hour and a half, maybe an hour and a quarter or so, on uh, the subject of Brave New World. Is the UK prepared for the future global economy? Uh, let me just uh, introduce uh, the panel. On my far left there is George Freeman, who is the UK trade envoy. And my Immediate left is Tim, Lord Tim Clement Jones, the Liberal Democrat peer. On my right, Stephen Green, former UK trade envoy, now uh, 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 in the House of Lords, former chairman of HSBC. And on my far right is uh, Steve Hughes, one of Policy Exchange's own. Uh, we're going to ask them to speak for between seven and ten minutes. Uh, on this subject. Uh, what we really want to do is to look at some of the long-term challenges facing the economy. Clearly, the economy is now in recovery mode. That's the first of the four R's I think we need to talk about. Is this recovery for real or is it a bit of a sugar rush? That's, that's probably the least interesting, I think, of the things we want to talk about today. Uh, three other things, three other R's. Rebalancing. Is the economy uh, rebalancing in the way that it should be, i.e. between the various sectors of the economy, uh, between the various geographical parts of the UK? Are we exporting enough? Are we exporting to the right regions of the world? I think some of the panellists want to talk a bit about that. Reform is the third R. Are we laying down the right sort of reforms that will make the UK a competitive economy that pays its way over the next 30 or 40 years? Reforms to, uh, to, the, to the way government does business, to the public finances, to our trade policy, to our labour markets. Uh, are, are we putting the structural foundations in place? Uh, and rewards is the final R. I mean, uh, this, this, this recent period has been marked by the really big fall in real incomes. What can we do to actually make sure that the rewards of growth are shared more evenly in the future? So, without further ado, I'm going to ask the, the panellists to speak in this order. George first, then Tim, then Stephen, then Steve, in, in the order they're sitting on the panel. George, kick us off, if you would, please. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Larry. Thanks um, for the invitation, Policy Exchange. Lovely to be here. I think just as we go into the pre-election purda, um, pre-election purdas used to last three weeks and then three months, and now I think it's 12 months. But I think it's a really important conversation which we need to keep having. So um, it really is a pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure because I'm just back as trade envoy from the Philippines and the ASEAN market um, with some uh, very um, immediate reflections, having gone out on that my first trip out there on how we're actually doing in terms of uh, this wider topic. Um, I really wanted to say three things. Um, uh, the first is some thoughts about the scale of this challenge and this opportunity. Um, the two are profoundly linked, I think, and how we should be thinking about it and communicating it as we go into the election. Uh, secondly, some thoughts about uh, public sector innovation and the relationship between reform of our uh, public sector and making Britain a market for innovation uh, that is um, uh, innovation that is relevant and will help the emerging markets uh, around the world. Uh, and thirdly, some thoughts on the area for which I've uh, just been appointed trade envoy, which is the Philippines market in ASEAN in the Pacific. Um, you referred to me as the trade envoy, which is very kind. I'm actually one of a number. Um, and I just wanted to start by just explaining um, that I don't speak for the government. I'm not a member of the government, uh, in case there's any journalists here. This is not, um, uh, I, I, I'm very much speaking uh, on my own account. Um, I'm newly elected. I've been in Parliament four years. Uh, part of the reason I'm excited about crises is that I used to work in uh, entrepreneurial small companies, financing startups. And for startups, the crisis in a big company is always an opportunity. And whilst we do have some very serious issues in Britain in terms of uh, our, our public finances, the debt legacy from the crash uh, and all that, I think it is a huge opportunity for us as well, which I think is part of the theme of today. Um, I have served as a PPS in the Department of Energy. Uh, I was then government advisor on life sciences and have helped David Willits to coordinate two of our industrial strategies in life sciences, our first flagship industrial strategy, and then in agricultural technologies. Uh, and I now work as a trade envoy. Um, but I'm speaking very much uh, on my own account uh, this morning. So um, some thoughts on my three headings. Um, the first is that I think, you know, as American entrepreneurs say, uh, every challenge is an opportunity. Uh, I genuinely think we face an extraordinary opportunity. 
Um, let me just give you a sort of big picture. I look forward to the day in 20, 30 years, God willing, when I can bounce my grandchildren on my knee and respond to their question, tell us the story, Grandpa, about how your generation turned Britain round and got us back on our feet and turned us from a declining nation into a world economic power again. Um, I honestly believe we have an extraordinary opportunity at a time when the European economy is still very badly suffering from the effects of the bank uh, crisis and its own structural uh, problems in terms of competitiveness and uh, economic efficiency. This, this country, blissfully outside of the Eurozone but within the European market, uh, extraordinary fast uh, and embedding economic recovery now at a time when the global economy is doing quite extraordinary things the last 20 or 30 years. I mean, really historic reductions in poverty, a huge uh, lot more to do and a huge amount more progress to be made. But the world is going through a really transformative period of economic growth and the nations around the world, the developing nations, not the BRICS who are really emerging superpowers, but the next 10, 20 nations behind them, uh, going through agricultural industrial revolutions in the next 30 years that we pioneered and went through in, two, in sort of 200. And I think that is an extraordinary opportunity for this wise, mature um, democracy economy to support that growth, uh, not as a military superpower, although with economic strength and a return of economic strength will come renewed diplomatic power, but as a global trading powerhouse supporting genuinely supporting those emerging economies to grow sustainably. And I, I have a particular interest in the area that I was investing in, in broadly defined life sciences, food, medicine, energy, the science of life, where I think we've got an opportunity to use our know-how, our knowledge, our science, our technology, our expertise to help those economies feed, fuel and heal themselves uh, in a way that is both an economic opportunity, huge inward investment for our technology businesses, huge ex export markets for us. But it's more than that, I think it's a model of growth that the British people could be proud of again and could feel, gives them a sense that this country's best days are indeed uh, ahead of us. And I think that's part of our challenge as a nation. I think people are quite um, concerned about the global, uh, um, about globalization and about where Britain fits in and whether indeed we do have a future, uh, a strong future uh, economically and politically or whether we're relegated destined to be relegated as a sort of fading European power to some second order. And I think actually this combination of political and economic diplomatic uh, uh, strength is a really important message for, to inspire the people of this country to have hope and have faith. Um, and I observe merely that last year we were the world's number one uh, in the rankings of soft power. And I think that's a really important message that we may not be a military superpower anymore, but we carry huge weight and influence around the world. And I'll touch on that in a minute in comments about my experience in the Philippines. So I, I think that my first message is really um, that we mustn't be, as a policy-making uh, uh, Whitehall group, depressed by the scale of this challenge. We should be excited by it, and we need to project that excitement both to the people in the public sector who are going to have to reform the way we deliver public services to tackle this, uh, this historic problem post-war of our structural deficit and this extraordinary debt legacy that we've uh, built up um, for ourselves over the recent last 10, 15 years. Um, and most of all, we need to inspire the public out there uh, that it is uh, an opportunity that, if we rose, rise to it together, um, uh, has extraordinary uh, opportunities for us, economic, but also, as I say, giving people a sense that this country's best days are ahead of us. Um, I, I think the last thing I'd say on that challenge opportunity is that uh, I think it does require um, a sense of unity of purpose, actually, that um, I, I would, uh, I, that I think this next year with the European elections, uh, Scottish referendum coming, a Euro referendum coming, I think there's something about mainstream politics, which has come under a lot of pressure recently and remains under a lot of pressure. There's something in that message of national renewal and national unity, nations united together in a challenging global world that is very powerful and inspiring. And I think actually the rise of UKIP and the rise of Alex Salmond politically, whilst um, challenging, I think they frame actually an opportunity for national political leadership in the context of global challenges. Uh, and in in my sector of life sciences, when I talk to people about how 
in the next 30 years, the world is going to have to double its food production from the same amount of land with half as much energy and water. That is a massive global grand challenge, and it's not one I suggest that UKIP or the SNP particularly have any answers to. And I think framing our mission as a nation in that context, helping the world to get out of poverty and get into a more sustainable, prosperous, and fulfilled uh, uh, phase of economic growth, is an inspiring moral as well as economic opportunity for us. And I think that's a message we would do well to focus on and encourage the Scots this September to realise they have a massive part of. They were a massive part of our agricultural and industrial revolutions the first time round, and I think they could be and should be a massive part of this uh, 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 opportunity too. So let me just turn secondly to my particular interest in the life sciences market. Um, uh, I've touched on this, so I define life sciences more broadly as food, medicine and energy. This is within the, within the context of a recognition that we're not going to be a low-cost manufacturing economy in this global market. We're going to be a high added value, smart, knowledge-based economy. Um, food, medicine, energy are the basics of life. Out there in the developing world today, there are hundreds of millions of people who don't have enough food, medicine or energy in countries where the elites in those nations have quite Western uh, style uh, aspirations, tastes and habits, but their uh, populations, all too many of them, millions and millions of people, haven't got enough food in their bellies, are dying of basic diseases that we can cure, uh, and are scrabbling around for firewood to heat and fuel their families. Uh, and I think that market, food, medicine, energy, in the next 30 years will go through the most explosive growth uh, as those populations develop, uh, and, and they're going to require huge technological support from us to do 21st century energy that is renewable and clean. They can't afford, we can't afford, the world can't afford the emerging nations to go through a, a, a fossil fuel based industrial revolution the way we did it. And we're going to have to come up with the technologies to allow them to do it in a way that is uh, um, resilient and sustainable. And that is a massive market for us. Britain has extraordinary leadership in clean tech, green technologies. Uh, we don't have uh, the industrial supply chain in the way that other nations do in terms of global transmission. So we're going to have to be an incubator hub for those technologies uh, and to be very open about how they get adopted around the world. Um, similarly, in medicine, we lead the world in biomedicine and in the research in medicine. Um, and we need to look at how we can use our biomedical life science sector and, our, and indeed our NHS to help these emerging nations develop sustainable healthcare systems. Uh, and develop, of course, markets for our healthcare innovation. But again, I think there's a national mission here that people would, uh, would really connect with, using the expertise we have in this country in running a health service and in, uh, in, and in research, using that extraordinary wisdom and expertise that we've built up 50 years of patient data, the world's biggest healthcare organisation, uh, to help the, those emerging markets. Uh, and in agriculture and food, uh, where we've just launched a UK agricultural technology strategy. This was the, world, the country that gave the world the, the seeds of the agricultural revolution. Uh, we still have huge strengths in our agricultural research base. It's become rather cut off in recent decades from our agricultural industry, which is uh, not nearly connected enough to these exploding emerging markets. And I'm really delighted the government's launched an industrial strategy for agricultural technologies, which is all about linking those three up, linking our science base better to our agricultural supply chain and then linking to emerging, uh, emerging markets. Um, and I leave you with this, uh, my third thought. Um, all of this sounds great, is it true? Well, I've just got back from the Philippines, uh, a, an exploding second tier economy, um, second tier uh, as in beneath the bricks, uh, 108 million population, GDP growing at 7.5% a year, uh, a Western orientated English speaking uh, nation right at the heart of that exploding ASEAN market. Um, and uh, what are the things that they are, are struggling with? They've got a construction sector, they've got uh, a, a banking sector, they're a classic emerging economy, they've got a huge energy challenge, they've got huge food and agriculture challenge, and they've got a huge healthcare challenge. So were they interested in our, in our companies in these spaces? You bet they were. Uh, and uh, is our trade mission out there in terms of bringing our innovative companies out into this market relevant, you bet it is, hugely relevant. But this was also interesting. The very wealthy families and businesses out there who are looking in a global market to invest, what are they interested in investing in? They've got huge portfolios in construction and energy and roads and ports and shipping and 
uh, what they're really interested in is investing in the 21st century, investing in the technologies that are going to both, both help their businesses develop uh, with less energy, less expensive requirement on expensive carbon uh, fuels, uh, help their country feed itself. Uh, and it's not a technology economy, and the Philippines doesn't have a sophisticated R&D base. So where do they want to invest? They want to invest here in Britain. And I think there's a really powerful model there for us to uh, support these emerging economies to grow, support them to become markets for our innovation, and make Britain uh, a place where, whoever and wherever you are around the world, it would be the natural place to come and grow a technology business, grow an innovative uh, product or service, get it financed here in London, a global centre of finance, it would be good for the city as well. Uh, and then we become a nation that incubates technology uh, and exports it around the world. And I, I would just make this point that I think our public sector reform agenda is crucial, uh, has a crucial part to play in this, because carrying as we have uh, a structural deficit through the boom years, I mean, let's not forget that under the last government, despite uh, it being a boom in government revenues, we were still running a structural deficit. So that's those bits of the economy that um, are growing uh, every year. They're contributing to a deficit in the government finances. And most of all, it's health and pensions and welfare, uh, but health particularly. So somehow, uh, in, in terms of this big challenge, Larry, we're going to have to both open up these markets, but we're also going to have to tackle uh, making sure that as a as a mature Western European nation, our public sector isn't draining, uh, isn't draining, uh, draining our public finances. And in order to tackle that structural deficit, it seems to me we're going to have to embrace innovation in our public services uh, much more. Uh, and I know that particularly in the healthcare market, uh, where we've got huge opportunities to make Britain um, and make the NHS a more, um, a more efficient uh, deliverer of 21st century medicine by embracing new digital diagnostics and devices and targeting our drugs better and doing personalised and targeted medicines uh, and it unlocks a completely different model of reimbursement. Uh, and I think what, part of what's so exciting about this is that we, we could break the apartheid between private and public sector and make Britain both a much more innovative uh, uh, deliverer of public services. I don't mean privatising them, I mean uh, allowing the, those virtues that the private sector takes for granted giving people responsibility for their own budget, allowing people to deliver more for less, rewarding people who do deliver more for less instead of punishing them, and redoing, re-engineering the way we support the public sector so that innovation and leadership and enterprise within a public sector framework is rewarded, that that is a fundamental part of creating a market for innovation. So in healthcare, we won't create an integrated healthcare economy by diktat from Whitehall, which is why it's really important that we allow the NHS to be freer to adopt its own ways of working. And within the NHS, we encourage regional and local diversity so that a thousand flowers can bloom and we can see what works. And it's really important, therefore, that we measure, we embrace data, and we track innovation and success so that people can see what's working. And that is a slightly different model. And by doing it, I think we'll, we have an opportunity to make our public sector more responsive and more innovative uh, and to work better with the private sector, uh, which supports this model of Britain as an innovation hub in a globalising economy. So those are my three thoughts. It's a massive opportunity. I think particularly in the knowledge economy, we've got uh, extraordinary markets. And my experience in the, in the Philippines is that it's true right now, as the Philippines begins to wake up, there are extraordinary markets and we are all too cut off from them. And I think the work that the Foreign Office are doing and UKTI are doing uh, is bearing huge fruit. Uh, and what struck me is that this opportunity is even bigger than I'd realised when I took on the job. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Larry. I think I'm going to be almost as uh, upbeat. Um, but first of all, what I'm not going to be um, talking about, wearing a political hat, I am not going to be um, expounding on the benefits of belonging um, to the EU, although I do think uh, they are considerable, particularly if we can create a genuine European uh, digital single market. Secondly, um, uh, even as a lawyer, I am not going to be extolling uh, the virtues of English law and law firms. I certainly hope uh, that people will take those for granted. Um, what I want to do uh, instead is briefly focus on four very interconnected subjects, the creative and tech sector, 
uh, skills, China and clusters, all of which are tackled in the policy exchange paper uh, and which touch and also on the way through touch on finance for startups, IP uh, and trade promotion on the way. So um, forgive the shorthand because that's a fairly um, uh, broad range of, of subjects. Uh, last year, the Korean fashion entrepreneur Sunju Kim, uh, uh, in an inspirational speech in Westminster, uh, vividly talked of Britain's future as a creative brain centre, which is an interesting expression. But I do suggest that a combination of the need to rebalance our economy and the success of the 2012 London Olympic and Paralympic Games made it clear that our future in Britain lies with our imagination, creativity and invention. And with the growth of digital platforms and applications, we've seen a huge convergence between the tech sector uh, and creative content. And in the UK, in fact, we are in the vanguard in the use of digital technology in our creative economy. And we're experiencing a wave of business creation in the sector higher than in any other major OECD economy. Uh, the creative industries, as currently measured, which I think is uh, very conservative, it should include software, uh, but doesn't, uh, is something like 5.2% of GDP, uh, and the growth has been uh, almost 10%, which is higher than in any other sector. Um, uh, and again, uh, it's 10%, over 10% of our export of services. Um, and something of the order of 1.6 million jobs are accounted for by that sector. Many people would say that if you include software as well, it would be rising to something of the order of 2 million uh, jobs uh, in their sector. Um, and as Policy Exchange in their recent technology manifesto themselves point out, uh, e-commerce accounts for a greater percentage of GDP in the UK than in any other G20 country. And our internet economy will be something of the order of 16% of GDP by 2016. So as they say, the next government's goal should be nothing less than to make Britain the fastest growing digital economy uh, in the world. And I think we're well on the way um, towards that. Last week we had London Technology Week, which was pretty much an upbeat affair, apart from the Bloomberg LSE report, which criticised our broadband speeds. And that's not just in rural areas, they criticised it in some of our uh, metropolitan areas as well. But to get there, there are a great many challenges uh, to overcome. There's the key question of startups in this converged sector uh, and what we need to do uh, to ensure their success. Um, we had a record uh, uh, 15,600 startups uh, in Tech City alone, in Tech City in London alone in each of the past two years. And that's out of something of the order of 450,000 total startups uh, in the UK last year. And tech startups now do have good access to early stage finance. There are a variety of uh, angel investors uh, uh, through the government seed enterprise investment schemes. And these models, uh, we, I was told, we were told uh, when the Communications Select Committee went to Google campus uh, just a few weeks ago that they're now amongst the best in the world. Uh, and the important thing is now promotion of these schemes to uh, startups. Crowdfunding is beginning to have a real impact, especially with the government's business bank uh, investing in the funding circle. Debt financing via banks, however, hasn't been so good in the sector, to say the least, although there are some honourable uh, exceptions amongst some of the banks. But it's in the later stages where hundreds of millions of pounds are required for investment or a venture capital exit is needed, where we're still behind Silicon Valley and NASDAQ uh, in New York. Are UK institutions too risk averse? If so, there's a danger of business moving to the US at that funding stage. But I'm glad to say that there is some evidence uh, uh, that from recent listings on the stock exchange that the creation of the new high growth segment uh, to encourage companies to list here is having an impact. So we are beginning to tackle um, some of those issues, particularly with the movement of some of the American uh, bank, Silicon Valley Bank, for instance, are coming over here uh, uh, and actually funding and financing some of our own startups here. 
The talent and skills available, however, are far below what we need. Uh, skills deficiencies have been exposed by digitization. We need something of the order of one million jobs, tech jobs, to be filled by 2020 to keep up with demand. And uh, so I do welcome the inclusion in the curriculum of coding and computer science from this September for five to 16 year olds. But in the short and medium term, we will still be reliant on overseas undergraduates and postgraduates. And so we've got to ensure that our visa regime is fast and user-friendly to attract them into, into employment and our higher education institutions. Now, although the creative industries are a key growth area, there has been the danger that the future of creative education in schools is at risk because of the introduction of EBAC, which is the performance measure for secondary schools. The truth is we need students going into the creative industries to be multidisciplinary, i.e. STEAM, not STEM in the jargon. Excluding those art subjects poses a significant threat uh, to the UK's creative economy. And I do, uh, in that context, because uh, just coming out with a degree or uh, coming out of secondary education is not enough. We need uh, students who understand the meaning of enterprise. And Lord Young's report last week, I think, was very significant. Uh, the news on the growth of apprenticeship in the creative industries is good, however. And nearly all of the broadcasters, many of companies uh, in the tech area, uh, uh, and many others in the creative industries are now providing opportunities for paid internships and apprenticeships. Uh, in many cases targeted at underrepresented uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. So on to the question of clusters. Clusters or hubs are of huge importance to the tech and creative industries and there are many more than just in London. But it does raise the whole question as to whether our cities are of the right scale, especially when compared with cities in emerging markets, and whether they have the necessary powers and control over their own finances. More than 90% of tax, for instance, is collected by central government. Now, Michael Heseltine uh, uh, made the case, I thought, very well in his paper, No Stern Unter uh, Unturned. He wrote in 2012 about cities and regeneration. Uh, and he said that power needed to shift back to municipalities. We're far too London-centric. That was his uh, thesis, and I agree with that. We need to make our cities competitive in the global economy and strengthen our clusters, especially using universities as incubators. And it's vital that we build on existing initiatives uh, like the uh, Local Enterprise Partnership, City Deals, and the Regional Growth Fund to get there. And we see that our own Chancellor does get it to some extent. He announced yesterday plans to develop a northern super city uh, to rival London as a global hub uh, to link up Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds and Sheffield. But it's more than just infrastructure. It is about uh, powers uh, and uh, 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 that sort of area and the right to raise taxation. And the RSA, the Royal Society of Arts, gets it too, uh, with its City Growth Commission, which is underway, uh, chaired by Jim O'Neill, and that's going to report in October this year, and I think that will also um, have an impact on the public debate uh, uh, about that whole cluster aspect. Um, then, of course, there's trade and investment between China and the UK in the tech and creative industries. Whatever the pessimists say, China still represents a huge opportunity for us, especially in the light of the post third plane and policies uh, to help encourage private enterprise uh, and consumer spending, and not just um, in FDI, which of course was the focus of much of last week's uh, visit by the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. Uh, the Chinese have been brilliant at devising new digital platforms, and we're the people who can provide the content, and we are getting there. At the recent Technology Innovators Forum in Qingdao, uh, Tiffin, uh, Vince Cable launched the Global Digital Media and Entertainment Alliance of China, which will promote long-term relationships uh, in the digital media and entertainment sectors. And it's a useful vehicle for dialogue on intellectual property uh, and copyright reform in, in China as well. Now, shortly, there's going to be a creative industries industrial strategy, uh, 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 international um, strategy, which has been developed by a working group of the uh, uh, Creative Industries Council under Tim Davey of the BBC uh, worldwide. Um, and I think that is going to draw some of those strands together um, as well.
So IP protection here uh, and abroad, I, I do believe, is of crucial importance. Business models are changing rapidly, uh, but all to a greater or lesser extent depend on good IP protection. We need here to ensure that penalties for online digital copyright infringement are consistent with those for physical copying, and we need to ensure better protection for metadata. Those two aspects are a crucial part of the digital economy. Uh, at Tiffin, with an expert panel, we looked at the environment for intellectual property and development uh, and protection applicable to the creative industries in China. In fact, the IP protection there is rapidly improving as Chinese homegrown IP grows in importance. Addressing issues of piracy and criminality in key markets, not just in China, but internationally uh, in particular, in relation to the internet, uh, is absolutely vital, as is how we influence uh, consumer attitudes to IP through education programs. Then, of course, particularly in this sector, we need to be realistic about the additional resource that, I, uh, that UKTI needs in order to service small and medium-sized enterprises. We have a terrific team of UKTI people in China uh, and in many other emerging markets with increasing sector specialization. Creative industries accounted for almost a quarter of UKTI's budget for the trade access program, as it's called, which helped companies exhibit at overseas trade shows. But, as the policy exchange paper emphasizes, UK companies, particularly SMEs, uh, need persuading to be bolder. We need to demonstrate the benefits of trade and investment with emerging markets much more effectively. So we need a much bigger pipeline of SMEs lining up to do business in emerging markets. Now, professional firms such as my own do play their part, but we need much more UKTI resource in the UK, especially in the English regions, to create uh, that pipeline. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, one of the disadvantages of coming after two such experienced speakers as George and Tim is that you find they've covered a lot of the ground. Uh, one of the advantages is you can see a few areas where uh, we can sort of build a bit on what they have been saying. Um, and I want to focus on uh, three or four points reasonably briefly. The first uh, is the historic nature of what we're living through. George alluded to this when he was talking about his role as grandpa. Um, he's much younger than I am. I'm already in the role of grandpa. Um, and uh, it is the case that uh, we're uh, living through a historic change. We talk a lot about it, of course, usually under the heading of the rise of Asia or even the rise of China. It is China that gets uh, the lion's share of the attention in this. But in fact, it's a much more broad-based phenomenon than that. Uh, and indeed, uh, six out of the ten fastest growing countries in the world at the moment and have been for the last five years are actually African. Uh, this is a phenomenon that's really quite broadly based through the world. And in historical terms, it's very simple to explain what is happening. There is a uh, convergence um, uh, moving away from a period in human history which is actually unusual by the standards of human history. What I mean by that is that up to about 1820, the size of your economy your, as a proportion of the total world economy was essentially equal to the size of your population as a proportion of the total world population. So in 1820, the largest economy uh, was China because China had then as now the largest population and the second largest was India because India had then as now the second largest population. We all know what happened after that, the Industrial Revolution, which enabled first Britain and then other European countries, notably Germany, and then, of course, America, Japan, uh, to move away from subsistence level for the broad uh, uh, mass of the population, to create economic surplus, and to take a larger and larger share of world output, such that, at its peak, the developed countries, Europe, North America, Japan, uh, were contributing about 75% of world output, and they never had more than about 15% of world population. And what is now happening is there's a reversion because other countries are catching up. The question is sometimes asked whether the uh, emergence of China, India, Southeast Asia, and now, as I've said, other parts of the world too, Africa, Latin America, is durable or not. 
or is this, not going, is this not a train which is going to crash into the buffers before too much longer? People repeatedly ask that question about China in particular. Uh, and there's no doubt that China has a number of major rebalancing challenges that it faces over the next 10 years. It is the case that the public sector is still too large a, a proportion of total enterprise. It is the case that investment and exports are too large a proportion of total output, and it is not sustainable in its current pattern. The good news, I think, is that the Chinese leadership knows that perfectly well uh, and are undertaking a fairly complex high wire act to rebalance the economy over the next number of years and for my money I think you'd be much better off assuming that they will succeed uh, than that they will fail. I think the central forecast has to be that China uh, will continue to grow uh, by European standards a pretty rapid clip for the next generation and I think that that's the right forecast also for the emerging markets more broadly. That means uh, that we're about halfway through the transition um, that, that historic transition that George alluded to. We've seen already hundreds of millions of people raised out of poverty, but there's a long way to go. We've seen hundreds of millions of people move from rural environments to urban environments, and there's a long way to go. Um, in the year 2008, the world passed the point where more than half its population was living in big cities. By the year 2050, 80% of the world's population, which itself will have grown, will be living in big cities. We are uh, probably only about halfway through what is happening. There are all sorts of challenges that are posed by that, of course. Uh, challenges, uh, competitive challenges. Uh, and by the way, those competitive challenges uh, will not stay uh, in the form that they initially present themselves as large, cheap labour pools. Um, very rapidly, and you've already seen this, of course, in the east coast provinces of China and in Singapore and a number of the other ASEAN countries, uh, countries moving up the value chain, competing more and more broadly across the range of economic activity uh, that Europeans take for granted. Um, challenges in energy. It so happens that Asia in particular is energy short, uh, as Europe is. The Eurasian continent, with the exception of the Middle East and some of the Central Asian countries, is energy short. Um, and the implications of the rise of China for energy supplies, the deal done with Russia a few weeks ago, uh, these will have geostrategic impacts on us here in Europe. But it's easy to dwell on the challenges. The, the opportunities are also enormous. Uh, both George and Tim have focused on a number of the opportunities, and they are there. They are there for Europe in general, and they're there for Britain in particular. It is the case, uh, as one of you said, I forget which one, the, 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 the British brand stands in extremely high regard around the world. When I was trade minister, uh, at no, uh, not in a single one of the 56 countries that I visited over three years did you have to, as it were, uh, beat the door down and get a hearing. Um, uh, everywhere you went, uh, people uh, were fully cognizant of and, uh, and respectful of and admiring of uh, what Britain has to offer in terms of technology and creativity. They often went on to say, uh, but we don't see enough of you. We don't see enough British businesses compared with French, Germans, Americans, Koreans, Japanese, Chinese, and so on. And when you look at the British challenge within the context of that global phenomenon, which, as I suggest, is only halfway through, um, uh, when you look at the British challenge in accessing those opportunities, then we have a rebalancing need for our economy. We need to shift our growth model away from the old one, which ran into the buffers at the time of the financial and economic crisis, which was domestic demand driven, and what's more, that demand fed by debt. We now know, if there's one thing we all know as a result of that, that that is no longer sustainable, towards a more balanced model in which both investment play a stronger part and exports or net exports play a stronger part. I'm not going to talk much about investment, but it's obviously a significant challenge for us. Investment both in skills, to which both Tim and George alluded, investment in infrastructure. I don't think the kindest friends of Britain would say we have a world-class economic infrastructure. Um, but I want to focus actually on the net exports side, the trade side, um, I, uh, and build on what both Tim and George have said. The shift to trade is important for us. We have run uh, trade deficits for actually all of the working lives of all of us in this room, I can safely say, um, since the 1960s. 
Trade has been a net drag on growth most of the time. Um, almost never has the trade, uh, the current account, uh, the, the, the trade account been in surplus, and very rarely has the current account been in surplus. Um, and uh, we need to do something about that. So far, we've had no trouble financing that, um, but I think it would be folly to assume that we will always find it easy to finance a 2 or 3% uh, net current account deficit in this country. That's the negative way of putting it. The positive way of putting it is that there's so much out there that we can go for. Uh, the shift to trade is something which is uh, uh, um, uh, playing into some obvious market opportunities. It's also, by the way, an extremely important device for honing up the efficiency of the whole economy. Study after study shows, and these are both uh, official government biz studies and also private sector uh, think tank and uh, other kinds of studies, they all show the same thing. That companies that get into the export markets grow faster, are more efficient, last longer, employ more people. Whichever way you look at it, shifting the balance towards a net trade position that is stronger drives the British economy's growth on a sustainable basis uh, and is clearly very healthy at both at the company level and at the macroeconomic level. There are two big themes that follow from this. The first is the importance of something that so far both uh, my two predecessors ducked, which is the EU. Um, the single market in the EU is extremely important to us. This is a market of 500 million people that is on our doorstep. It's a market where in goods, reasonable progress has been made in taking away the barriers, such that, for example, you can make a car in this country and export it to all 27 member states, other member states, with no modifications, apart from moving the steering wheel to the other side. Um, and that's the result of a single market in goods which has been driven by Brussels regulation. We don't celebrate this nearly enough. Um, and in market after market, having regulations that drive the single market forward is very definitely in our interest. In the services sector, the report card is much less good, um, beginning to make a bit of progress now, but actually in all sorts of areas of services exports, too many barriers to entry across the single market and therefore uh, underperforming, both for the European Union's citizenry as a whole and for British exporters in particular. Um, in the digital mar single market, we're barely off the starting blocks. That's important to us. Uh, A, for the reasons that Tim outlined, we're extremely good at this. Uh, B, in every single one of the 28 member states, the percentage of trading which is online is rising year by year. It is obviously, again, in the interests of the EU citizenry as a whole, as well as of us in particular, that we work to remove the barriers. We can only do that by a very proactive engagement on the issues of the single market. Uh, and I might as well put my cards onto the table. I think for us to attempt to withdraw from it would be balmy. They need us, we need them, uh, and we need to work very hard at the case for that. Um, the other point about the single market is, of course, that if you were a small business exporting for the very first time, it's often the case that the safest and easiest place to start is to go across the channel before you, for example, tackle the Chinese market. So the testing ground of the single market for accessing the world's wider economic opportunities is something that is profoundly important to this country. That obviously takes us into a reform agenda for the EU more broadly, and I'm not going to get into that in the few minutes that I've been allocated. I want finally to talk about two things very briefly, the importance of trade promotion. Um, uh, both Tim and George were kind enough to sing the praises of the uh, UK Trade and Investment, the body that I oversaw whilst I was minister. Um, there is uh, somebody in this audience uh, uh, who, who I recognise, uh, recognise a number of faces, um, uh, uh, who have been very closely engaged in that trade promotion work. This is important. It is important that we invest in it properly. Um, I believe, too, there's an extremely important strategic role for chambers and trade associations to play in this. Um, if I compare us with some of the most obvious competitive look-alikes, France, Germany, for example, um, the role played by our own overseas chambers is relatively weak in too many countries, and there's work to be done to help them uh, improve their position so that they can be real active supporters of incoming smaller British businesses in particular into their markets. And then finally, trade policy. 
um, trade policy, which is done as part of the European Union very effectively by the Trade Commission, uh, the, the, the Trade Commissioner in the Commission. Uh, I think it's one of the strongest parts of the Brussels machinery. Um, and the role of the European Union in, for example, getting the trade facilitation deal done at the WTO last December was central. Um, it was a very important role played in what was a very important deal, not, not properly understood, not properly recognised uh, for the success that it was. Um, and driving the, through the follow-up to that will be, again, a major item of international interest as well as uh, of interest to us. Um, so, there we are, trade policy, trade promotion, these are important, encouraging the British economy to look outwards, be flexible, and take advantage of the historic opportunities that are thrown up by a broad sweep of human history, which is taking place before our very eyes and is probably only halfway through. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to Policy Exchange. Um, Stephen mentioned the fact that we're in this transition and that there's a central protection for growth of the emerging markets, which I think is a very important point because ultimately we don't really know what's going to happen in the next four or five decades to the global economy and what kind of trends that will throw up. And what I really want to speak about today is what is happening in the UK at the moment that is resulting from the changes to the global economy over the last three or four decades. These are issues that I think we're still trying to get to grips with um, and cause important pol public policy uh, responses to them, which will make sure that the UK is prepared for the future global economy. The first issue that I want to talk about is the labour market. And the greatest or the latest trend that is going on in labour market economics at the moment is something called the hollowing out of the labour market. Now, this is the fact that low-skilled jobs and high-skilled jobs in developed economies are taking up a greater share of all jobs that are out there. Now, the problem is, is we don't really know uh, what's causing this. We can have a good guess. We can say that technology may be replacing those task-based jobs in production or administration. Uh, or they could be going to the low wage cost economies of the East or something like that. But ultimately, we don't know the size of the problem. And there are also other things that are thrown up by globalisation as well that create problems for the labour market, such as migration and the impact that has on low skilled workers. Now, the problem is, is we don't know how big these problems are. We don't know what effects, say, uh, it has on labour mobility. We don't know what effect the hollowing out has on the retraining of those employees and where they go after they've lost their jobs. So that creates a situation where the government needs to make a judgment about the costs of intervention versus the benefits of intervention like it does with anything. And equally, we don't really know how effective those interventions may be. Which leads me on to the next point, which is around the public finances. Now, the public finances are under enormous stress, not just because of what's happened because of the global financial crisis, uh, but because of long-term trends. Now, on the spending side of things, we have a changing demographic. Everybody's getting older. That necessitates that more will be spent on the basic state pension. It necessitates that more will be spent on health if current policy doesn't change. We know that's going to happen. So how are we going to fund those programmes? Well, on the revenue side, there are even bigger questions. We know, for example, that North Sea oil production is going to decline. That will lead to less exchequer revenue being raised. We know for a fact that the fuel efficiency of cars, for example, uh, will improve and that will mean less fuel duties for the Treasury as well. But what we can change and what government policy can do is alter things like corporation tax and get part, uh, take part in the global race tax competition that will attract mobile companies across the globe to the UK. Now that, of course, is very pertinent at the moment because there's public opposition to the tax management of companies, say, Starbucks, Google, Amazon, uh, you know the rest. So how can the UK respond to that? Well, the truth is, in a globalised world, we need international coordinated response to do that. But in the course of the crisis, which leads me on to my next point, there's a public scepticism about some global institutions such as the IMF, such as the World Trade Organization, and other governance structures as well, most notably the EU. Now, the recent European elections have shown the anti rise of anti-establishment parties, uh, su uh, suggesting that there is a tendency toward anti-integration uh, and what that means for the EU, but we don't really know how far that will go or whether 
um, it will increase in size or decrease in size. So there's a few of the problems that we face at the moment from globalisation. But what about the challenges that uh, respond to these challenges? And really I want to talk about two things. The first is short-termism in public policy making. So we have an electoral cycle of four or five years which leads to decisions around public policy issues that might not necessarily be convenient or the best placed for the UK's economic development. A classic example would be Heathrow uh, or aviation expansion more generally. If the Davies Commission recommends next year that Heathrow is the best option for aviation expansion, uh, for expansion of aviation capacity, and the incumbent government at the time accepts that recommendation, it ultimately means we'll be back in the same place that we were six years ago. Now, does that harm international competitiveness? What does our international competitiveness erode when there's those kind of uh, decisions going on and the time taken to make those decisions? And the second thing that I want to say is that measuring the economy and identifying these problems is fine, but measuring the impact on measuring the problem becomes increasingly difficult in a globalised world. Another classic example would be the Rotterdam and Antwerp effects on exports. So, for example, we know for that numerous goods exports go to the port cities of Rotterdam and Antwerp. What we don't know is where they go after that. They get recorded as an export to those cities when the goods get... Uh, taken off a ship, but we don't know where they go af where after. It's expected to be a small issue, a small measurement error, but it serves to exam uh, exemplify how these things can impact public policy decisions. Um, and the final thing that I wanted to say before we move into the questions is really the answers around these public policy issues does dictate whether the UK is prepared for the future global economy. And the public finances, for example, I think the UK is ready for the future public, uh, global economy, but I think we're reaching some forks in the road in decision making that means uh, which will dictate how well we do in these. The public finances, so a good start has been made on deficit reduction. We've had other fiscal controls put in place, such as the welfare cap, uh, and we've raised the state pension age, again, responding demographic change as well. But the other point of that is how far can we go with repairing the public finances when public opinion it could turn against austerity. The labour market, the UK is one of the most flexible labour markets in the world, um, but then things like the migration cap may counter that in the future. And then finally, obviously, we have the situation on global governance where we are part of the single market, we are part of the EU. But, again, the fork in the road ultimately becomes the referendum. What will happen if the UK leaves the EU? Nobody really knows. We can talk about different models of existing outside the EU, maybe the Norway model or the Swiss model, but ultimately we don't really know what that will really look like or what the transition to those models will really look like as well. Um, so to conclude, the several issues that the UK faces now that have been kicked up by globalisation we don't know the scale of these problems at the moment, really necessarily how to respond to them, but we will have to respond to them in the next few years. Um, and just to finally say that on the issues of public finances, labour mobility and productivity, Policy Exchange will be doing work on all these issues over the course of the next year, so look out for that. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, very good presentations, awesome food for thought there. Um, it's now time for questions. I'm going to um, ask a question which I want the panellists to think about and ask at the end. I'm not going to just drop it in now, but what one thing would you like to see done both now and over the long term to make a difference? We've raised some lots of issues there, trade policy, clusters, competition policy, labour market. So each of you, what, what one thing do you think would help this transition to a more better balanced growing economy that pays its way now and what longer term issue do you think really needs to be addressed? But now I'm going to open it up to questions. If you could uh, put your hand up and tell us who you are and keep the questions nice and short because we haven't got that much time. There's one gentleman there in a blue shirt and one gentleman there in the front row. We'll take those two together. Thanks. George Crozier from the Chartered Institute of Taxation. Uh, we seem to be back in favour of industrial strategy, at least in terms of picking sectors 
rather than picking companies. And I heard George Freeman talk about that again today. Um, I'm just wondering if the panel thought that this was a good thing, if governments are good at picking sectors that are you know, national champions effectively, <coughs> and if they had any particularly good examples of where they think this is working well. And this gentleman in the front row, perhaps you could. Even if one accepts the rosiest prediction in terms of uh, education progress and uh, digital society and digital economy and so on, one has only to walk in the street or ride a bus to find out that not 100% of the population is highly skilled, creative, and, uh, and extremely ambitious. Now, traditionally, you know, the construction business has taken up the slack in most countries with 15 80% of GDP to absorb the unskilled uh, workforce. I don't see any, let's say, plan to deal with people who are unskilled in uh, the future of the global economy. And uh, that could be a particular problem in the, in the drain. And I wonder whether the panel just think that the solution would be to buy everyone a PlayStation and pay for them to stay at home and we forget about them. Okay. Very good, thank you. Um, George, just take the first question about industrial policy and sectors. Is, is, are we moving to a, a world of you know, more government involvement in industrial policy after a long period where government took the back seat? And, uh, are we moving to a smarter in industrial policy? Yes, I, th I think we are. I'd point you to Peter Mandelson's comments at Davos in 2012 when he said, um, odd though he perhaps found it, it's George Osborne and Michael Hesler and uh, David Willits uh, setting the pace on British industrial strategy for, for 21st century. I, I think there's something very different from 1960s, 70s industrial policy. I use the word strategy to try and capture that difference. I don't think this is about propping up inefficient industries. I don't think it's about state... Um, creating jobs to, to, uh, as a sort of job protection. I don't think it's protectionist, um, and I don't think it, it is or should be um, about sort of um, uh, um, you know sort of uh, overly protective defence of strategic British industries. What I do think it's about is looking at Britain's ability to compete in this global economy and looking at those markets and sectors. So it's picking the races rather than the winners. And I don't think any of the industrial strategies we've launched identify a particular company and say, well, we will um, support you with government funding. It's really looking at how public and private sector can work together. Uh, I think it's looking at procurement, for example. And uh, you know, government, whether you want government to be 30, 40, or 50% of GDP, it's big. And how it spends its pounds has a real impact on markets for, uh, for innovation and private sector. So I, I think 21st century industrial strategy is about knowledge economy, about IPR, about making us a great place to, for innovative new businesses to flourish. I think it's about looking at the relationship between public and private sector. It's about industry-led strategies. All of the ones we've, let, we've launched, uh, I think it's now nine or ten in government, have all got an industry uh, a group. Really, it puts industry at the heart of Whitehall to help. Uh, make sure that voice is loudly heard. And the best example, I think, of why this approach works is the automotive sector. Uh, from being crippled in the 1970s by uncompetitive working practices, bad management, bad uh, strike record and all that, the industry has um, climbed, clawed its way back. And we're now, this last year, for the first time since the 1970s, a net exporter of cars. That was done through a long-term industrial strategy. It started by looking at what we still did really well in the 70s and 80s, which was um, components, technology, and then we looked at skills. The Automotive Council worked with governments, conservative governments in the 80s, labor governments in the 90s. Uh, and it's, it's led to a great success story. We lead in Formula One, we lead in components, we lead in 21st century automotive technology. And that's what it's about, not uh, propping up regions or companies. Do you want to talk about, about cl I mean, clusters? I mean, you talked a lot about digital clusters. Is, is that something that just emerges as a result of the, 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 the you know, market forces, or is there something that government and state can do to facilitate 
I, think, yeah. both of those I think there's a lot that uh, government can do. I mean, the transition, if you like, from Silicon Roundabout um, to Tech City was something directly attributable to, in a sense, government action. I mean, it, you know, the, re the Prime Minister, in a sense, altered the name and a lot of things followed. But, you know, this is exactly as George said, this is a partnership between um, government and industry. Um, the one I'm most familiar with is the Creative Industries Council, and they looked at um, issues to do with financing of creative industries, uh, uh, and things have improved over a period of time. They've looked at other um, factors holding back the creative industries, and to a large extent, that's what these strategies are all about. It's, you know, how do we take government action to provide the context in which um, business in this sector can thrive. It's not like the old um, uh, policy of, of picking winners, exactly as George said. It's a different way of looking at things. And uh, the proof of the pudding is in the fact that there are sectors that have been crying out for their own council, their own strategic council, um, uh, because others have had it and they've seen the benefits. Tour the tourism industry, for instance, has been asking for its own uh, uh, strategic tech council for quite some period of time. They finally got one the other day uh, with the new um, Secretary of State announcing it, which was uh, good news for them. But, you know, it's not as if they want a whole mass of new regulation. They, if anything, want encouragement. They basically want government to understand the issues they have. For instance, VAT in competition uh, with other tourism destinations. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a facilitation, it's an enabling uh, mechanism more than anything else. Stephen, take the question about unskilled workers. Are we just going to give them a PlayStation and say... I thought it was a nicely provocative... Rudy, I've known for a long time. Yeah. A nicely provocative question. And you, and you can't accept the, the implied thesis that there's nothing you can do to help people who don't have adequate skills for, uh, for the modern economy. Um, there are no quick fixes, however, at the risk of stating the obvious. There is no magic wand. Um, two things. One, one, it takes us into education policy, on which I am not an expert, so I'm not going to transgress, but clearly getting what people are taught at school right uh, for, 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 for the 21st century is important. And uh, Tim's reference to the importance of STEAM and not just STEM, uh, I think it is relevant here. Um, but the other thing is uh, the apprenticeships. Now, uh, one of the things that we did, the many things that were done wrong in the 1970s was to allow the apprenticeship system to collapse or to wither on the vine might be a better way of putting it. Um, and we, uh, I, I don't know how good it was before that, I'm not an uh, economic historian, but what is very clear is that in the 80s through, uh, we were weakly positioned on apprenticeships um, and all that went with that uh, 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 in terms of equipping um, the manufacturing sector in particular, but increasingly the services sector as well, with the appropriate types of skills spread through the population to generate A growth and B employment. The good news is that starting really, if I'm right, with the major government and then ramped up by the Labour governments and then ramped up further by this government, apprenticeships are now, in volume terms, really pretty significant. I'm a bit out of date with my numbers, and, and Steve may correct me on my numbers, but when I was uh, across the road in the Department of Business, the number of apprenticeships start, a portion of the size of the economy, was about the same as that of Germany. There's still big issues about the quality and the match between apprenticeship output and, and the real needs of the economy. So plenty of things to work on, but compared with where we were 25 years ago, we're much better positioned. And the main message can only be, we have to stick at this and stick at this over a generation. But we can't. Uh, to, to, uh, as I say, Rudy's a provocative. Uh, <laughs> the, the notion of handing people out PlayStations because nothing else they can do you know, is, is a counsel of despair that we can't accept in human terms and don't need to, I, don't, I believe, either. Yeah, I want to come in. I'll just uh, talk about the, you know, the industrial strategy point very briefly. One of the pieces of the government's industrial strategy or coalition government's industrial strategy has been the creation of the British Business Bank. Now, the aims of the British Business Bank um, are to fix a market failure where there's a uh, for the provision of finance for small and medium-sized enterprises. Now, in the lobbying before it was created and just before it was set up, it was often kind of talked about in the media as this would be some kind of silver bullet to solve the financing problems of small and medium-sized enterprises and the KFW in Germany and the Small Business Administration in the States were held up as a blueprint to copy uh, and to show how successful these organizations could be. But the problem being is that the SBA in America and the KFW 
in Germany have existed for 50, 60 years, and have been part of the lending and credit landscape there for that amount of time, and allowing, to, allowing it to become integrated into those systems. So the question would be is whether any part of the industrial strategy, or whether uh, particularly the British Business Bank, will be able to be kept going and has the resources to be effective in what its aims are. Why shouldn't it? Why, why shouldn't it be given time and given resources? What's, what's just well, it's, it's short term, isn't it? Sometimes these structures by government get removed. I mean, for example, if you look at the RDAs, I was never a massive fan of them. But if you're just going to reorganise kind of regional uh, government, which has an economic purpose before allowing it to serve its full function or just to amend it rather than get rid of it, but it has, it's already had quite an important leveraging impact, though, hasn't it, in crowdfunding? Yeah, uh, and no, that, that has been really quite I'm beneficial. Not, I'm not saying that it's a bad idea. I'm saying, will it be? You're you're sure it's 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 yeah. 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 Oh, I just want to make one point about the, the, the industrial strategy, because I think there is a danger that when governments invite business to sort of sit around the table, particularly when we're talking about innovation, globalisation and competition, there's a danger that people get too comfortable around the table and that you've got the people sat around the table who were the leaders of yesterday. And there's a real challenge to make sure that we're opening up the doors of government to the companies that, that are just being formed, the people who are cutting, particularly in technology, who are cutting new ground. And th that is quite a challenge for is government. Is that happening? I mean, you, you know, if, if you look at the, the sectors of the future, you would probably pick out things like biotech or robotics or... Yeah. So there's a, there's a real problem. And, and, and is the government getting in these, these bright people from the universities, from, from Manchester, from... Yeah, I think we, we're getting much better at it, but it is quite challenging for the Whitehall machine. Um, you know, it, it, in life sciences, officials know who GlaxoSmithKline and AstraZeneca are, but um, not many of us know who the really pioneering companies changing the world on health data, metrics, informatics, and devices are out there. But they are the people who need to be allowed in, and I just think we need to be, if we're talking about innovation, it, we've got to constantly be making sure that the new people are at... Are at you know, around the table. And you're absolutely right. The university spin-out uh, 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 context is <laughs> very important that they should get more involved as well. There's more questions. The gentleman there in, in, in the blue tie, uh, the, there's, a, there's a woman uh, just behind in a purpley dress. Let's take a couple of questions. Sorry. Um, thank you. Ron Stewart-Brown, Trade Policy Research Centre. I'd like to strongly endorse what Stephen Green was saying about the importance of the EU and trade matters, both internationally at the level of the World Trade Organization, and internally with the wonderful work that's done in lowering trade barriers in, for example, the current strip between the 28 different member states. Um, equally, don't we need to recognize that if you look at UK car exports, they've more than doubled to the rest of the world over the last five years, whereas they've actually declined to the rest of the EU. And the broader picture, when you allow for the Rotterdam Antwerp effect, we reckon is that by the time of the prospective referendum in 2017, proportion of UK exports of goods and services going to the rest of the EU will be down to 37% on current trends. Um, on Thursday evening, Friday, we, yes. there's going to be a meeting in Eden um, where the drive to political union is going to become very strong, clearly. Um, shouldn't we be considering looking for a looser trading relationship with the EU to negotiate to stay in customs union with it, which is a really good thing, but not the other political aspects which I think the majority of people are not so keen on now in this country. Okay. There's, there's a woman just behind you. Yeah. Um, Felicity Birch from EEF. Um, I was very interested in some of the comments about um, long-termism and industrial strategy. Um, it's something that we're working on at the moment at EEF. Um, and I, I wondered, actually, um, how I think we can build on industrial strategy, not just now, but, I mean, all the strategies in place are for the existing 10 years. Um, what do we do after the next 10 years? How do we make sure the new sectors, the emerging technologies, um, are around the table? And actually, the industrial policy um, strategy sorry, um, continues to deliver um, for the economy as a whole. And maybe, um, is there a role for an exit strategy from um, industrial um, strategies if they stop working? Okay, uh, there were a couple more. Let me. There was, there was a woman there in the, in the back, second row from the back. That's it. <coughs> um, this is alluded to a little bit, but I just. So who, who are you? Tell oh, sorry, my name is Kathleen. I'm a student. Yeah. Uh, it was alluded to a little bit the kind of importance of the regions, because um, it's very easy to see how these things are going to work for London, because London's already a very attractive destination worldwide. But how is all, how all of these things are going to spread out over the rest of the UK, and is there scope for radical change in like local government, um, and how can that help? Okay. Uh, 
That's a good question. Right, let's take those. There are a couple more, and I'll, if I can get them in, I will do. Um, who'd like to take the question? EU, looser trading relationship. Stephen, you talked about... You, 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 you talked about... You, 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 you talked about... <laughs> no, I, I said we should have a digital single market. Okay. Um, I'll put some of the others on the spot too, but I mean, uh, would it work? Would a looser trading relationship with the EU work, do you think? Uh, Look, th th this is an obviously very controversial question uh, and highly topical too, because as uh, Ronald mentioned, uh, there's a rather important meeting taking place the day after tomorrow. Um, I'm, I'm dismayed personally by the extent to which... Um, the commentary on this whole question of the presidency of the Commission is, fo is, f is focused on personalities and or on the uh, arm wrestling um, between Parliament and uh, the Commission, uh, excuse me, Parliament and the Council. Um, whereas the real issue should be uh, about whether we can find the right person to lead radical reform uh, in the European Union for the interest or in the interest of the EU as a whole, all of its citizenry not as a piece of British exceptionalism, um, but simply because uh, the real need for the EU in this 21st century world is the same as it is for the UK. That is to say, we need to be flexible, outward-looking, competitive, given all of those historical changes that are taking place. So who is the best person to lead the reform should be the question. I am not going to get into uh, uh, giving opinions on what the answer to that question is, but I just think that we need to focus on the importance of radical reform. Do I think there is a serious alternative for Britain to being part of that debate? Can we paddle our own canoe in some way uh, and, to mix my metaphors, strike a deal with the European Union if we were on the outside? I personally don't think that that is anything like as good an option. I'm, I'm, I want to be clear about that. I don't think that the Norwegian option is, is a good option for this country. Still less do I think the Swiss option is a good option for this country. We would be kidding ourselves if we think we could get access to the EU market without taking on board the regulation that, uh, that, that, uh, that is in place for the EU market. Uh, and we'd also be kidding ourselves if we think we could influence that regulation as well from outside as we can uh, where we are inside. That does impose, being on the inside, a presumption that we're prepared to fight the corner of the single market and uh, people have their own views on how well British governments successively have fought the, uh, I I for the interests of the single market. Um, but I do actually believe, to be clear about my own views, uh, that there is no serious alternative for this country. So we do indeed face some difficult times ahead because we've got to fight for a reasonable EU in our interests but actually also in the interests of the EU citizenry as a whole. George, you want to talk about... Uh, well, about the, the, I, I quite like you to talk about uh, the, uh, the long-termism point, but also, uh, uh, you know, I'll put you on the spot, I mean, what, what's your view about it? Is, 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 do we have a viable relationship, trading relationship? I'll touch on all three, if uh, I may. Um, yeah, I mean, I think well, this is the question. It's the question we are embarked in. We're in a reform and renegotiation and then referendum process. I think the British people want us to be uh, an active trading partner in the common market that they voted for. Um, and they don't like the look of being part of a very ambitious, progressive sort of political union. I think that's clear. The issue is what can we negotiate? I think it's also clear that these global markets are enormous and if we could rebalance our trade with those emerging economies, then the European question also becomes economically, um, it becomes uh, sort of less, um, you know, less than number one economic issue. But I think there are these huge markets overseas. Um, I would just make this point on innovation and science. You know, Europe has for hundreds of years been a leading world force in science and the Enlightenment and, and all of that. In some of the key areas of bioscience, Europe is in danger now of out-regulating regulating itself and therefore us out of the market. So in some of the biomedical science, in some of the stem cells, in data, in agricultural technologies, in GM, we are in danger of turning Europe into a backwater. And that is a real issue at the time when the science creates huge opportunities around the world for us. Um, so what's the, what's the answer? I mean, you, you, the other aspect there is that if you look at the list of the top 10 universities in the world, then very few of them on the continent of Europe, and most of them in North America or in the UK. Or, you know, Europe it seems to be falling behind in some of the sort of key driving forces of future growth, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I published a fresh start report on this in January. We looked at two markets, medicine and food. Um, in medicine, actually, Europe has done very well post-war and is now stuck and in danger of going the wrong way. I think we've got a huge opportunity as, Br as Britain, leading biomedical research nation, to change the rules and, and to exercise leadership. 
On agricultural technologies, um, I don't think anyone is very optimistic, actually. The mainstream view in Europe through European democratic institutions is, a, is pretty hostile to agricultural technology, and the government is now saying that we're going to put it on the agenda as if we can't get the, the basis that we need, we'll renegotiate it and repatriate. But it would be better to have a European framework that was better aligned with, with our own. Um, just on the point about long-term industrial strategies, I think uh, it's a really good point. The most important thing is that we measure progress properly, um, not in words, but in metrics. Um, and I think all of the industrial strategies, it's really key that we set out what success looks like, we measure it like any good business and hold ourselves to account. What sort of metrics, though? Because there's a danger there of becoming too short-term, isn't it, demanding, demanding success too right. quickly? I mean, you have to have some long-term metrics. It's 10 years, but, I mean, you know, the, most of these strategies are 10 years. On agriculture technology, to give you an example, we've said we want to see more inward investment into our UK science base from overseas. We should put a number on it. Um, we've said we want to see more UK uh, industry, public sector collaboration on research. We can put some numbers on those. Um, just on the regional point, I mean, my own region of East Anglia, I think, is a really good example. It's an area that post-war has been treated really as a sort of rural backwater by successive Whitehall administrations. Very little investment in infrastructure, a lot of agriculture, a lot of retirees, a lot of commuters. Actually, if you now look at it in this context, Norwich, Cambridge, Ipswich, we've got world-class research parks in biomedicine, in IT, in clean tech, in uh, engineering, automotive, Formula One, and data. Um, if we thought of it differently, invested in the Cambridge Norwich fast railway, invested in these clusters, it becomes, it is already the only net contributor to the, to, to the Exchequer out of the City of London. It could be a new California of innovative small companies trading in a rural connected economy. That's a different vision and it's beginning to happen. I see it in my own constituency. T small businesses flooding into villages. Things in the new Santa Barbara. Isn't well, it? you know, hold that thought. Sounds good. Um, Quickly, Tim, you talked about um, you know, regional policy in your presentation. What, what could the government do to actually move the, some of the centre of gravity of the economy out from London to the regions? And g given that actually there is very little local revenue-raising power there, should that be the first thing the government does, make it easier for local governments to actually raise more money? Uh, I, I think well, it, it, in order to give them some scale and control over what they do, yes, I think you have to be somewhat selective. Um, I do think that infrastructure in the way that George has talked about it, and indeed um, George Osborne uh, is proposing, has something to do with it. Um, but it's the, it's, it, what I think the real difficulty is, is that some of our cities really don't have the scale that they need. I mean, Liverpool, after all, is twinned with Shanghai, but Liverpool it, city is about 250,000 people. Shanghai, well, you know, how big is Shanghai? Probably 10 million. Uh, at least, at least, at yes. least you know, <laughs> you know, well, quite, you never quite know how, how big they've got to by the time you finish your sentence, so to speak. Um, but, uh, you know, it is, it is, they are totally different in scale, and we need to, in a sense, consider, I mean, I forget, it's uh, probably uh, Jim O'Neill who's coined the phrase again, he coined the phrase bricks, I think he's coined the phrase man pool now, um, and we do have to be thinking of scale uh, in those terms. Now, the big, dif the big difficulty for me is whether you actually go as far as creating local government municipal structures that reflect uh, these metros. That, for me, is, is the big difficulty. What you certainly need to do is to facilitate, you need to drive down uh, uh, responsibility for transport, you need to allow local government to raise capital funding and so on, and in combination, at the very least, through local enterprise partnerships and so on and so forth. What I'm still struggling with slightly is whether or not you actually uh, go for structures being changed, because, you know, we all know whether we look at our national institutions like the NHS, that structural change doesn't always deliver uh, what you want it to. Coming you to come in very briefly, there are a couple more questions. Right, well, very quickly on regions, two points. Firstly, on Liverpool. Liverpool actually punches well above its weight with Shanghai. Does. Um, and I think the, the importance of twinning effectively for commercial reasons should not be lost sight of. Um, I also think it's a real shame that not more cities opted for elected mayoralties um, than did whenever, they got the whenever it was two years ago when they had the opportunity. Because I think elected mayoralties are a great force for raising the profile and raising the self-confidence of a of an urban area. And thirdly, uh, for the regions much more generally, what I found when I was trade minister was, uh, and I committed myself to going around the country 
twice a year to every single English region plus Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. And you found in every sector of the economy, in every region of the country, world-class companies of all shapes and sizes who got their tails up and were taking the world on. Um, so I ha you would come away from these trips knowing that we've got the potential very broadly spread throughout this country to get this right, this rebalancing challenge. You're not um, starting from a weak competitive base. We actually have it all there in terms of human ingenuity and creative drive across, as I say, or even, even the most traditional economies, agriculture, absolutely there as well. There are a couple more questions which I'll take briefly. Gentleman at the back. Um, Luke Herbert from Jaguar Land Rover. Uh, from our own growth, we've been struck by the, the scale and um, size of the potential opportunities in the UK supply chain, but also um, major gaps in terms of skills and the opportunities that there are well, for UK citizens to make most of those, but um, the issues they have in accessing skills and the availability of the appropriate training courses, etc., that work for, for suppliers. Um, and also on innovation, we see major shortages in terms of engineering, but also our supply chain here in the UK not doing as much r d say, as, as uh, uh, their headquarters on the continent. Um, do you think here in Westminster, amongst Parliament, government, organisations like the Voice Exchange, for this great new world, so yes, that question, do you think there's an understanding of the um, scale and speed in front here, and that's going to be the last one, I'm afraid. Hi, uh, Kat Tull from um, the Law Society Gazette. You spoke a bit about um, Steve hovering out of the labour market, um, but I was just kind of interested in uh, what your, your views were on um, the role of the mid-skilled sort of jobs market within the global economy, certainly in the legal sector, this is something that sets for over the next 10 years, and uh, always what whether that was a good thing or had an impact uh, in any way on kind of global competitiveness. Steve, perhaps you'd like to take that question. Yeah. Um, actually, can I just both? Of course, yeah. Is that yeah. Uh, on the first point on whether, whether Westminster recognises um, the scale and speed necessary to make these changes to the landscape of skills to, to benefit UK companies. I used to work for the British Chambers of Commerce uh, a few years ago. And we had representative bodies throughout every region. Um, and I do, think, I do think there is a little bit of a perception issue with inside the M25 about what happens outside the M25. I don't really think there is a recognition that there are very uh, high value add, manufacturing, high skilled companies across all regions of the UK. And one of the things we tried to do while we were there was trying to take policy makers out to these regions to try and introduce them to these firms in, in an educational sense. And I think that's enormously important. But that's the responsibility of your representative bodies, industry representative bodies, to take that message to Westminster. Um, on the mid-skilled point, the literature on the hollowing out of the labour market shows that it is an actual phenomenon. But it doesn't necessarily say what happens in that mid-skilled area. And the point is, is that almost it's a, a constantly changing body of employment within that distribution of labour. Um, and that mid-skilled jobs are changing all the time. So therefore, the public policy response to that, unfortunately, my answer is going to be it's uncertain what that should be. Okay. Now, if we're running out of time, I ask you... Uh, 20 minutes ago, what, what, what one thing would you like to see, to see done now to, to prepare Britain for this brave new world? What, what long-term thing would you like? Uh, one thing I'd uh, like to see is probably a beefed-up export um, support services and inward investment, so UKTI. I think we should have more resources to be comparable to our competitors and nations. Steve? What's your what's long-term? Long oh, long-term. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, infrastructure would be my long-term. Big infrastructure projects. Getting big infrastructure projects off the ground in the I, I think I've got a simple answer which it does for the short term and the long term and I'm going to add it, which is to stick at it. I think we've got quite a lot in place now. Um, courtesy of the last government and of this one, um, I, I've referred to apprenticeships, a lot of us have referred to um, 
much more focus on industrial opportunities, sector by sector, uh, a structure in place, stick at it. And actually, my short term is, I'd love to revisit the question of elected mayoralties for the big cities. I really do believe that would transform uh, the, the, the self-confidence outside of the M25. Um, I'm going to cheat. Medium term and long term. Medium term, more powerful uh, metro chambers of commerce, if you like, which may be a way of joining things up. We don't have, and Stephen referred to this, we don't have what the continental systems have, but the, the, I think they are a useful mechanism if we can get there. And then long term, uh, we have to have a European single digital market. That's absolutely vital, and we can only get that by remaining a member of the EU. Thank you, George. Uh, I'd like every department of government to have a duty to support innovation through its procurement and to have to publish what it's doing, its metrics, and make itself accountable um, for how it's using. A bit like the Americans, they have a 20% SBIR program. 20% of every federal dollar has to support small companies. Something that insists that Whitehall puts innovation at the heart of its spend. That's the short term, what about the long term? I think long term, um, to promote real adoption of innovation in the public sector, we need to think about some a sort of new deal for bits of the public sector where instead of the very tight treasury <coughs> controls that have actually made it very difficult for bits of the public sector to make that initial investment in innovation that then delivers savings, to say, if you give us a sensible plan for what it is you're going to spend your, in your innovation money on, and we'll share the savings that you deliver. We won't take them all off you. We'll share them. I think you create an incentive for inspired public sector managers to be more innovative and entrepreneurial and deliver huge savings and structural reform. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. I think that's been a very, very constructive, well-spent hour and a half. Thank you very much to Steve, to Stephen, to Tim, and to George. Thank you all for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed.